How do you do? I'm Dusteru, and I want to talk to you about Dead by Daylight's Forgotten Chapter. See, Dead by Daylight is getting up there in age as we slowly approach the eight-year mark. Very soon, we'll be right in the average lifespan of a Pomeranian pup. <laughs> so Dead by Daylight is pretty old by pet standards, and with age means content and DLC. And eight years means a lot of DLC. Whether it be original, licensed, paragraph, or anime costume collection. So with a lot of content usually means a lot of good ones, and a lot of bad ones. Oh brother, this guy stinks! And a few that have fallen through the cracks into obscurity. Most have some redeeming qualities to them, maybe the survivor the killer was loved. The map was unique, or an infamous addition. Maybe it was just a lineup of quality perks. Each of these can keep alive the memory that there was in fact a chapter released at some point during whatever three month period it came out in. The chapter I want to talk about is the one that I feel is relatively the most forgotten to exist out of all the chapters. The killer by most players is considered a dud inclusion. Most people don't want to play them, most people don't want to play against them. A survivor so disliked and hardly ever touched, you would think they were some sort of war criminal or something. A map generally disliked. At best, you will just hear people not dumping all over it. The only thing you ever see to remind you of this underwhelming chapter is one meta perk. And another one that was recently reworked so much so that it feels like it's a brand new killer perk dragged in by Alan Wake himself. One that I totally knew was being changed and didn't happen while I kept putting off this video, making me re-record and edit several sections of this video. No, that didn't happen at all. And another annoying perk you choke down annoyance at any time you see it in solo queue. No, this chapter is not the Binding of Kin. This is not Dead by Daylight's worst chapter, or biggest game-breaking chapter, or stuck in the floor using your power chapter. This is Dead by Daylight's forgotten chapter. The year is 2021, November 30th. One of the worst times to play Dead by Daylight is almost in full effect. A disastrous MMR system is destroying the morale of Survivor and Killer players alike. I was playing a game of Survivor and I looped the Killer for seven consecutive hours and I unhooked, you know, 18 other Survivors. I fixed 10 generators. I know that you died, so we just ignore that. Everything changes and everything seems to stay the same. Boons, Circle of Healing, is at full power and making Killer gameplay absolutely miserable especially any character who depends on hidden runs, and not one-shots. And Dusteru is about to take an absolutely massive break from Dead by Daylight and play a bunch of other games, especially one up-and-coming new entry in the asymmetrical horror genre. <laughs> I'm sure that's gonna go well. Failure. November 30th drops. Hype around it is actually pretty high, as the new character is being hyped up as possibly Dead by Daylight's newest strongest, or second strongest killer, to be released in the game. The reception around everything else is mixed to annoyed, and it launches. Portrait of a Murder. Introducing the artist, a woman whose whole motif is that she's a bird with the power of the entity's own crows. A power that has nothing to do with the crows in the trial, and another female killer with no shoes. Ah, can't say anything this time though, because those aren't toes, those are talons. Big difference. Her power consists of dropping a very big bird head down that will shoot surprisingly slower than you would expect. I get more penguin vibes from their mobility over crows, but that's just me. These birds will wait for the killer to activate and then shoot straight forward in a line, wherever the artist placed them down, going through walls and any object like an Omega Blink nurse but without any of the threat behind it. When survivors are hit by the big bird, they are then swarmed which allows a second bird shot to injure them. But don't you even dare think about doing that, because if you want to play her well, you won't be doing any cool long distance shots. No, 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 that's for boring, unoptimal gamers. Instead, you will use your ranged bird as a zoning tool, and basically only a zoning tool. Put it in front of a pallet, a window, and force a survivor to run past and take damage the true pinnacle of interactive and interesting gameplay. 
And once again, don't you dare go for those ranged shots by the time you place down another bird. If you didn't place three to get that first hit, they've already shooken them off or jumped in a locker and gotten rid of them. So to keep the story short, the bird does not do a good job at flying far. This is the most deceivingly short range, long range power out of the bunch. And the best part is you will keep trying to do those long distance shots for fun and it will burn you every time until you finally do what everybody else does and start playing another character. You may get stabbed in the head with a tag or a sword. You may be burned to death or skin alive or worse. But when they torture you, you will not feel the need to run for though you die. The resistance lives on. I'm not going to put much effort into breaking down her lore as the writers didn't really seem to care much either. The artist's name is Carmina Moira who was born sometime in the 60s, perhaps early 70s, in Chile. She was active during the Pinochet dictatorship. He was a bad dude and Carmina didn't like him very much, so she painted abstract and surrealist art as a form of rejection of the current government. A rejection of all the government's oppressive control and countless injustices to the subjected people of Chile and yada yada yada. You know how sensitive these artistic types are. They see one crime against humanity and can't shut up about it. TLDR, she was a good person despite her life of unfortunate events. From her mother leaving, her brother's lack of breathing, and her father sneering, she chose to paint how awful everyone's life is under this singular force that sucks the life out of all of them and revels in their misery. Wait, that seems familiar. And then one night, her and her friends were taken captive, and she was stripped of parts like an old car. After looking like a fully dismembered Miss Potato Head, a murder of crows flocked down and killed every single person, friend and foe, except Carmina. And now she willingly joined an even worse dictator, who killed her friends and helps continue a far worse suffering than she fought against most of her life. The perks she brought to the realm are the closest thing to relevance this chapter has going for it, so let's take a look. We have Pain Resonance. This perk from launch has basically always been meta. I wasn't around for much of the 3 gen kick era as I was doing much better things with my time. While not as powerful as it once was, it is still a staple in any build on any killer because of its simple but effective and oftentimes clutch and game winning effect. I'd give it a 9 out of 10. Always has use in basically any build you can think of, but sometimes scourge hooks like to be located as far away from down survivors as possible. So not perfect, but pretty much close to it. Then we have Grim Embrace. Pass. Next we have Hex Pentimento. And that's a lot of text. Seems that there is a lot of you out there that don't know what this is and never go back to your cleanse totem, causing me to anxiously wander around the map trying to find this rekindled totem so we can finally do gens again. Please memorize this perk! You won't see Pentimento too often, but when you do, it'll usually be paired with Hex Plaything and my misery. 7 out of 10. Fine, I'll talk about Grim Embrace. So there's two versions of Grim Embrace we need to talk about. The one it was for a long time, and the one we got around a month ago. So as bad as this perk looks, it did in fact actually see some play. You know those tome challenges where you get random perks? I'm sure some killer got unlucky enough to get Grim Embrace while doing that challenge. 3 out of 10. There are worse perks, but that's not a very high bar to meet in Dead by Daylight. Once known as What Does That Perk Do, Grim Embrace was recently reworked to be the single most annoying perk I've played against in a while. People always complain how survivor gameplay is all just about holding M1 on generators. Well, no more. Now with Grim Embrace, we have all the pieces finally to make a new killer meta. Forget gen regression. What are you, some kind of boomer? All the cool kids are vibing with this new meta called Sit There Simulator. Forget holding M1. The only thing you're going to be holding in that hand is your dick, or titty, or both. Waiting for the timer to tick down. Honestly, they made it pretty good, 8 out of 10. Also, fun fact, the artist is the only killer on the roster that actually comes with a fourth perk. It's actually a crazy cool idea they added that not enough people talk about. And this perk is called... Dead Man Switch. You will see this perk on artists so much, it might as well be base kit. I'ma give this perk an 8 out of 10. 
Just about now, I'm sure one of you three artist mains are getting your feathers ruffled about how I don't know anything about your mama bird. And she's the best thing to happen to the game because she's just really strong and pretty? With a very unique and dynamic power. Or is that just the voices again? It's getting really hard to tell the differences between the chirping anymore. Yes, the artist is strong, just like the odor of many anime convention attendees. Not all of them reek, but the few that do are pungent enough to make up the difference. She is indeed powerful, but the artist is somehow one of the rare situations in Dead by Daylight that is powerful that still does not see play. Now that is an accomplishment in its own right. You have to be a special kind of undesirable to be very powerful, but still in the bottom five when it comes to pick rates, right below Singularity and right above Freddy. But hey, on the plus side, the artist is picked almost three times as much as the twins. God, what a depressing statement. A single killer does not a chapter make, so it's time to talk about debatably Dead by Daylight's worst survivor. We have Jonah Vasquez. The most notable thing about him is that he's considered the Guy Fieri guy, and then being a war criminal. But people like saying Guy Fieri a lot more than ex-CIA drone striker. Flavortown! There is a lot to say about how little there is to say about Jonah, but I will give him something. He is quite out there in design, from his haircut and his interesting choice in glasses, to his colorful garb. He definitely likes to think that his fashion style is straight from Flavortown, but it seems like a lot of Dead by Daylight players just seem to not have a taste for him. Could be his looks, could be his voice, but it's probably how awful his perks are. Let's start out with probably his best perk, Overcome. So when it comes to being played, it doesn't really overcome anything else. <laughs> Why are you booing me? That was funny! So I would not say this perk is awful, but you won't catch me saying it's great. Sure, you get a large speed burst after being hit, which sounds great on paper, but every time I use this, the distance you actually gain does not feel like very much at all, somehow feeling like hardly any longer than a sprint burst, which is fine, but its biggest flaw is that it only works when you go from healthy to injured. Then and only then do you get this slightly better sprint burst. Does the killer have one-shots? No value. Is the killer constantly keeping you injured? Legion, Plague, most stealth killers, any of them that want to just toss on Sloppy Butcher for fun? No value. You rarely get a chance to use this perk compared to basically every other exhaustion perk. And when you do, it's at a pretty big cost. Don't use this perk. Don't buy this perk. The only time I ever run it is when I'm going for a Medal of Man build. And that's only because I want to use something else besides Lithe and Sprint Burst for a change. 5 out of 10. There are tons of worse things you can run, because at least the effect is decent for what it is. But there is also a ton of better options and more fun ones too. But this is what happens when you have 131 survivor perks to pick from. Also, remember when I said this is probably his best perk? Yeah, that wasn't a joke, so buckle up, because we have two more stinkers to get through, and then we can talk about the litter box of a map these two shipped with. And then we can all go back to forgetting this chapter ever existed. So let's talk about a perk I like for its idea. Definitely a top tier perk when it comes to being impractical. This is Boon Exponential. So let's make the perk unbreakable again, and make it technically unlimited and work for everyone on the team, as long as the boon is up. Unbreakable, you know that perk you never need until you don't have it? And when you do, the killer just seems to <laughs> vacuum you up the exact microsecond after downing you? Yeah, that one. So let's take that perk and add the need to set it up beforehand. And you have to be within a pretty small radius of 24 meters. Oh, and the killer can just remove it from the map whenever they wish. If they down you while inside its radius, they're gonna hear it. So you better hope that the totem is further away. You starting to get the point now? If you run this perk, you're probably not going to be able to actually use it. But in one of the many millions of universes where you actually do get to use it, it'll usually be at the cost of tons of time and effort for maybe a game surviving effect. So if you're willing to play a hundred games to maybe get that one chance, this might be the perk for you. 
The only time this actually sees play is in Mega Boon Builds, where you just reach into that massive bag of perks and pull out every single boon perk you have, and make one singular shining beacon of ultimate power somewhere in the map because it's funny. And only funny. This is a 3 out of 10 perk. The effect is pretty meh for the infrequency you would actually be able to use it. Don't buy this perk unless you really want to make that mega boon. And now we come to the biggest stinker of a perk they have ever released. I'm dead serious. Look through every single survivor perk in the game and I will tell you why even the worst of the worst is better than this perk. This is corrective action, something behavior should really get better at since they do it so often. Do you get it? Do I need to explain? A perk that relies entirely on another survivor failing a skill check for the massive effect of just getting a good skill check? I know your teammates seem to fail healing skill checks anytime they're healing you, but even in that situation, this doesn't even work. Only when you're both doing the same action will this effect even work. This is what you would refer to in card games as a pack filler, or better yet, a perk filler. The devs remembered this chapter was going to be released in a couple days and saw they forgot to add a third perk. This is what they came up with over their poutine in the behavior break room. This perk sucks. And before you say it's good for new players who are probably matched with other new players, and they're all just missing skill checks like they're blind, deaf, basically Helen Kellers, you would be right. But I ask you, who comes to Dead by Daylight, looks through every single survivor in the roster, and chooses to pay money for Jonah? I'm sure all the 55 year old TV food celebrities picked him up first chance they got, and probably got a lot of great use out of this perk but that's a relatively small amount of player. So I'm going to say, for the most part, the people who would find this perk helpful never knew about its existence until they had Jonah as one of the last few survivors for them to purchase, or long after their first This Game Is So Killer Sided post on the forums. Just thinking about this perk makes my stomach churn with how offensively dog shit it is. At least Technician works on your own mistakes. I can't believe I just said how Technician was a superior perk to anything. <laughs> that should honestly be a crime. So we've covered both the killer, the survivor, and their perks. Which the most of you still left at this point in the video have probably already blocked out of your memory. But we need to finally talk about the map. The map I honestly should like, but just can't help but not care about at all. The Eerie of Crows. This is honestly one of the oddest things about this chapter that even to this day still confuses me, as I usually only really hear about this map when people talk about how much they dislike it. Even after being reworked from a long ass fettuccine noodle, to being smushed down into something more tortellini shaped, it's still not a great map. It was never anything I could exactly put my finger on exactly and say this is the reason people don't like this, as there is a lot to love about this map. Artistically, it has some of Dead by Daylight's greatest work to date, the main building specifically. On the outside you have this massive, overgrown tower that pierces into the heavens like a rusted sword of a long dead god from an age long forgotten, which has various crows spiraling around the tip. This image is nothing short of breathtaking. Then we head into the main building into a sandy, coated, corrupted library where books float in the air like a feather under a fan. The actual floor of the building does not really have a lot going on but we have a very distinct and unique type of structure we have never seen up to this point and will probably never see again. That being multiple walkways suspended above. This causes a lot of logistical imbalance issues, but personally I really enjoy its unique take on the structure, making some new interactions with certain killers. My favorite being ignoring this pallet up here and just lunging past with demo. It's a fun shakeup for how maps usually function. We definitely shouldn't see a lot more of this, but I am happy for its existence. What it adds is more than the issues it causes for me. The rest of the map is a sandy, overgrown graveyard that has ink dripping out of the ground into the sky, with a special shack that is completely made out of stone and kind of like a mausoleum. It's all very cool in what it wants to pull off aesthetically. But even with all these large and conceptually cool additions, I can't get over the fact about how much it annoys me playing on this map. I can't place exactly why I feel gross being here, 
but I do. It's probably the bright ass sand and how distracting it is. But there has to be more for why I don't like being here. A lot of the loops kind of bother me. These fence ones feel incredibly painful to play against as killer. And then you have a few loops that are just terrible as survivor. Like what the fuck is this? Seriously? Who okayed this? Overall, just like 95% of this chapter, the map has a very strong idea that had potential to be some of the best content ever added into the game. But the execution was so poorly handled, they needed to give the sword a few more swings to actually follow through. But I'm not really the best person to be talking about maps, as, well, I'm one of those few gross people who likes indoor maps, even the RPD. Hey, wait, what, what are you doing? Hey, get off me! Hey, let me go! Hey! Ow! Stop grabbing me there! Help! Help! You can't do this to me! I was kidding, okay? I, I, I was kidding! I was kidding! I, I hate indoor maps! They should all be removed! Okay, we should only have square-shaped maps with garbage tossed everywhere! I'm sorry! I'm sorry! Don't do this to me! Don't do this to me! Ah! I managed to free myself for the time being. Someone has to end this video, and I know I'm not great with that already, but I'm doing it now. So what are your thoughts on the portrait of a murder chapter? Am I completely off base with this video? Remember, if you disagree even slightly, that means you think corrective action is a meta perk. That's what disagreeing means. You wouldn't want that to be stuck on you, would you? But seriously, let us know your thoughts on it. I want to like this chapter, but it just gives me so many reasons not to. But that is just my opinion. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more videos or topics like it, please hit that like button and maybe even subscribe. A second for you and a ton of help for me. But I have taken up far too much of your time already, so I just want to say thank you all for watching. My name is Dusteroo, and I will see you all real soon. Bye-bye.